everybody, and welcome back to The Poor Man's Chemist. There'll be fire, dust, and metal flying all around, and the radioactivity will burn into the ground. In this video, we will be continuing our exploration of stereochemistry and chiral versus achiral compounds, and so much more, because your punishment by isomerism is far from over. Does it make you curse me? Hate me? Does it make you want to see me in hell where I belong? And now for our customary time of me begging for money like some kind of organic chemistry e-thought. It doesn't really matter how much money you make or how much money you have. If you are learning something from this project and you would like to support your favorite content creator so that he can keep putting these videos out, um, there are links in the description for you to do so. You would have my absolute undying gratitude. Um, if, if I was in physically in your presence, I, I would happily like kneel before you and mildly debase myself for your amusement um, because yes, I am a chemistry whore. But that's okay, it's current year, and apparently it's alright to be a whore these days. Who knew? But hey, look, okay, I'm an organic chemistry whore, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm much more of a refined call scientist. Alright, now, we are going to pick it up with section 5.4a, tetrahedral versus trigonal stereogenic centers. Um, I am going to kind of break away from the textbook a little bit and just jump around a little bit. I think that I can condense um, some explanations of some things a little better than it does and maybe we can get through it a little bit quicker because there are other things that I think we are going to have to spend a fair amount of time on. Now remember from the last video, chirality centers are tetrahedral stereogenic centers, meaning we talk in sp3 hybridized carbons, all right? Cis and trans alkene isomers contain trigonal stereogenic centers because remember, sp2 hybridized carbons are trigonal planar. They are flat triangles. You can always superpose a flat triangle over its mirror image if you rotate the fucking thing. Same for sp hybridized carbons, which are linear. You can always superpose a straight line on top of its mirror image if you just rotate it 180 degrees. Okay? I think, I hope, that is hammered into everyone's minds to the point where everybody gets it. Remember, too, from the last video that if you have a carbon that ha is bonded to two of the same thing, it is not a chiral carbon, all right? Everybody with me? Cool. Now, the textbook wants to have another little blurb about the biological importance of chirality. You can see here in a grossly oversimplified representation of the situation why this is so, okay? So you see one enantiomer here can line up perfectly with some binding site on something in the body, um, or any other living thing for that matter, whereas the other enantiomer cannot, all right? One can interact with the biological system, the other cannot, or it doesn't interact nearly as well. As I've mentioned before, this is the situation with methamphetamine. One enantiomer is much stronger than the other one. I think it's like, like the weak one is like 70% as strong as the other one. So it's not, I don't know how dramatically stronger it is, but whatever. Now, what's going on there is, see, and let's clear up a misconception here. Methamphetamine does not bind to a dopamine receptor, okay? It's not binding to receptors at all. Well, not, not like you're thinking about it at all. Methamphetamine binds to the dopamine transporter, and it acts as an inhibitor of the dopamine transporter. So you have this little protein that's hanging out in the synapse between your nerve cells, and whenever some, you know, one nerve cell, um, you know, shoots its dopamine jizz into the synapse, you immediately have the dopamine transporter, which starts grabbing up that dopamine and shuttling it back into the cell. This is one way that dopamine is cleared from the synapse so that, you know, the signal stops and, you know, the neurons can reset to fire another signal, 
okay? When you have methamphetamine, it comes in and there's some binding site on the dopamine transporter to where it will lock into it. Now, clearly the other enantiomer will also bind to it, but because it is not chiro, you know, it's not the perfect enantiomer, it doesn't, it isn't a perfect fit, it does not bind as well and thus is weaker. All right, this is true for many, 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 many drugs. And I'm not just talking the kind that make you happy. I'm talking all manners of different pharmaceuticals. It's also on um, flavorings. Like the entire perfume industry is, all it is is dealing with shit that's chiral. <laughs> well, not again, not everything. As we've seen, not every fucking molecule is chiral, but an overwhelming fuck ton of them are especially if they have a biological origin okay and you can see it here you have limonene one enantiomer is found in oranges the other one's found in lemons I think we can all agree that oranges do not taste like lemons now it's not just down to this one fucking thing but still yes this is one of the reasons why oranges don't taste like lemons it, it all comes down to chirality and stereochemistry. Now, you see here, I am not the only one that has a hard-on for thalidomide. The textbook does too. Actually, I really don't. I just think it's a very interesting compound. <clears throat> and, and see, I'm not lying to you. Evidence began to appear indicating that whereas one of the thalidomide enantiomers has the intended effect of curing morning sickness, the other enantiomer, which was also present in the drug in an equal amount for reasons we discuss later, um, was the cause of flipper babies, okay? The drug is still being used today on highly strict regulations. If you're a woman, you have to take pregnancy tests because flipper babies are expensive. Um, if you're a dude, and especially if you're a dude like me, like, I have no contact with, with females, especially not pregnant ones. I have nothing against women. I just, not a lot of women in my life because I'm a dude that's into other dudes. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, there's, no, there's no real risk of me interacting with any chicks. Anyway, I don't know. I don't have AIDS. I'm only HIV positive, and it's extremely well managed. So I'm not a candidate for thalidomide anyway. It's just Sylvia Plath wrote about, did a whole poem about this shit, man, so I just wanted to try it once. But anyway, I am going to use this as an example to show you another test to figure out whether a molecule is chiral or not. And I want to go ahead and introduce to you how this situation gets a lot more complicated real quick than what we've been talking about so far. Okay, so you can see here, using my mad MS paint skills, I have a structure of thalidomide over here and another molecule whose name I don't actually know over here. Now, I want to point out something important here, okay? First of all, let's see if we can find where is the chiral carbon in this molecule that is actually making this a chiral molecule, okay? Now, we know that sp2 hybridized carbons are not chiral so we can see over here the benzene ring these are all sp2 hybridized carbonyl carbons remember carbonyl group is carbon double bonded to oxygen that's sp2 hybridized as well remember anytime you've got carbon double bonded to anything it's sp2 hybridized so we know that none of these are it okay we've got more carbonyl groups here these aren't it so it's got to be one of these three, okay? We see here that both of these carbons are bonded to two hydrogens each. What do we know? It's bonded to two of the same thing. That ain't it. So it's got to be this one here, all right? And let's take a look at it. Is it bonded to four different things? Well, this is a more complicated question because, as you can see, it's part of a ring system. So how should we look at this? Well, we got a hydrogen, and we've got this mess over here, right? So those are two of our things. Now, we want to look and see, because the question remains the same. Is it bonded to two of the same thing? Well, let's we'll start going around the ring. Here, it goes to a carbonyl, then it goes to the amine. Here, it goes to an sp3, another sp3, then the carbonyl, and then the amine. It is not the same in both directions. Therefore, this counts as two different things, all right? Over here, that is not the case. 
over here, when we have this car, when it's bonded to this carbon in the ring, we look and we see it's bonded to a hydrogen, it's bonded to this mess, and then we look. It's bonded to an sp3 hybridized carbon there, sp3 here, carbonyl here, carbonyl here, and then the amine. That makes these the same. Therefore, this counts as two of the same thing. All right? Does everybody get that? Now, there's a much <laughs> simpler test that you can do, and that is called looking for a plane of symmetry in the molecule. If you can draw a line through the molecule around which the molecule is symmetrical, you know that molecule is achiral. So, for this one, we can draw a line just like this and take a look in this molecule it is symmetrical on both sides of this line there is a plane of symmetry through this molecule so it is a chiral here we cannot draw a line that gives us a, a symmetrical division of this molecule it's impossible therefore the molecule is chiral everybody see that so now you've got multiple tests that you can use. Is it bonded to two of the same thing? It's not chiral. Is it have a plane of symmetry? It's not chiral. Everybody see that? All right. I think now you should be pretty well armed to be able to identify chiral carbons. All right. Now that we've talked about all that, let's go down to the section in the textbook where it actually discusses this. So it tells you all the stuff that I've already said here about it. Um, read it on your own, of course. I want to point out, though, that the plane of symmetry doesn't have to be horizontal. It can be vertical. It can be any way through the molecule, so long as it is symmetrical on both sides. And you can see here, this one's achiral. This is chiral. So, again, this is a nice, easy way to be able to tell at a glance if you're dealing with a chiral or a chiral molecule. Now that you have a thorough understanding of what chirality is and how to recognize it, you need a way to name it. And so we come to the RS system of naming enantiomers, also known as the kahn engel prelog system. And you wanted to know. Now you know. And if you remember that, I swear to God you will look like a fucking boss in organic chemistry class. When I was taking advanced organic synthesis in school and... Um, I ha still had to do a research project in order to get my bachelor's degree. I was taking that class, and the professor was lecturing about something. I can't even remember what. And um, this came up, and he goes, does anybody know what this is called? And, of course, the classroom is silent for a second. And then I just say in a really bored kind of voice, it's the Kahn Engel prelog system. He, he let me, he asked me by the end of that class if I wanted to do my research project in his lab. So, yes, remembering that this is the Kahn Engel prelog system can open doors for you. And if you're watching this before taking organic chemistry, you will look like a fucking boss if you drop this in the class before the professor says it. <laughs> now, this gets involved. I really hope you've got a good mental eye because you're going to need it. So, we see the two enantiomers of 2-butanol right here, okay? So, we got two different ones. We need a way to name this shit. So, we can designate them either R or S. R means rectus. S means sinister, as in Latin, I think, for right and left. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's Latin. Um, so, you know, you can also look like a badass if you remember what R and S actually stand for. All right, everybody, get out your notepads because you are going to need to remember this system and how to do this for pretty much the rest of the course. Um, also, the Kahn Engel prelog system of assigning priorities is used in other things in organic chemistry, so you're definitely going to want to remember this. This is how you figure out if a compound is R or S. So, the first thing we want to do is we want to assign each of the groups bonded to our chiral carbon a priority. 
this priority is decided based on atomic number, okay? The higher the atomic number, the higher the priority. Okay, let's see what the textbook says. Each of the four groups attached to a chirality center is assigned a priority or preference, A, B, C, or D. Priority is first assigned on the basis of the atomic number of the atom that is directly attached to the chirality center. The group with the lowest atomic number is given the priority D. The one group with the next higher atomic number is given the next priority C, and so on. Okay? In the case of isotopes, the isotope of greater atomic mass has highest priorities. We won't be dealing with that too much in this course. Um, all right, so we see this with 2-butanol here, okay? We've got oxygen, which has the highest, hydrogen, which has the lowest, so there's our A and our D, but we can't assign these two groups, our methyl and ethyl group, a B or a C priority based on just these rules alone. You need more. So let's give you more. When a priority cannot be assigned on the basis of the atomic number of the atoms that are directly attached to the chirality center, then the next set of atoms in the unassigned group is examined. This process is continued until a decision can be made. We assign a priority at the first point of difference. Okay, so for this one here, we can see that the methyl group is bonded to three hydrogens, all right? So our only choice from here is hydrogen. This one is two hydrogens, but a carbon. So the highest choice over here is hydrogen. The highest choice over here is carbon. So this group has the higher priority. Okay, everybody see that? So now that we've got our A, B, C, and D, what do we do next? Next, we rotate the formula so that the group with the lowest priority is directed away from us. So this is your eyeball that I'm sticking with a mouse pointer. And hydrogen is pointed away from you. So you can see these th three groups here, which are closest to you. You can see the diagram of it here. Okay? All right. Now, we trace a path from A to B to C. If, as we do this, the direction is clockwise, the enantiomer is designated R, rectus, right. It is going to the right. So, if it's going clockwise, it's R. See that? A, B, C. That makes this R2 butanol. If the direction is clockwise, counterclockwise, the enantiomer is designated S for sinister, left, because it would be going the other way, towards the left. Everybody see that? I hope. It's actually not that difficult once you get used to it, but it does take some getting used to. So let's apply your newfound skills. Let us figure out which enantiomer of bromochlorofluoroiodomethane this is. Is it R or F? Is it S? Well, this is a super easy one. The Order of priorities, iodine is the highest because it has the highest atomic number. Bromine is the next highest. Chlorine is the next highest. Fluorine is the lowest. A, B, C, D. Okay, so we rotate the molecule so that fluorine is pointed away from us. And then we go from A to B to C. All right, everybody see that? So that would make this S, bromochlorofluoroiodomethane. Okay, very, very simple once you get used to it. Now, the first three rules of the kahn engel prelog system allow us to assign an R or S configuration for most compounds containing single bonds. For compounds containing multiple bonds, one other rule is necessary. So, groups containing double or triple bonds are assigned priorities as if both atoms were duplicated or triplicated, like this. So if you had C double bonded to some atom Y, you would treat it as if it was actually this. Everybody see that? So you would basically turn this into a single bond situation so that you could apply rules one through three. Okay? If it was a triple bond, you would do it like this. And notice that when you do this, it's always imaginary Y you know, to your C, and imaginary C to your Y. 
I know this can be a little confusing at first. It really can. This is something that you're going to have to maybe do some problems at the end of the chapter to really wrap your mind around. And if you're going, but PNC, I don't have the answers. How do I know? PNC will say, copy the problem and paste it into the search bar on the search engine of your choice because you are not the first person to see this problem. Many students have seen this problem, and if there's one thing that students know how to do, it's cheat on their homework on the internet. And there's tons of tutorials that answer either the same question or one that is very similar. All right? Yes, you will have to do some work. Again, nothing new there. Organic chemistry does not come easily, but then what worth having does. So, thus the vinyl group is of higher priority than the isopropyl group, okay? Because this has treated as if this were the situation. Okay, everybody see that? This is the isopropyl group. I hope everybody remembers that from our common names a few videos back. So, we're going, we're checking to see what the priority is. We convert this into this, exactly like we saw up here. All right, and we see here in our isopropyl group, here's the first carbon on both of these. In this case, it is bonded to a hydrogen and our imaginary carbon and the real carbon. Everybody see that? Here, it is bonded to a hydrogen, a real carbon, and a real carbon. All right, well, no point of difference there, so we keep going. So for the next one, this is bonded to two hydrogens and an imaginary carbon. Next point of difference, there's two methyl groups. They're identical. They have three hydrogens. So our imaginary carbon has higher priority than these hydrogens. And so the vinyl group has higher priority than the isopropyl group. I really, really hope everybody can see that. Again, if you're like me, I had to work through several problems that are like this in order to really wrap my mind around this when I was in school. So if this is the first time you're seeing this and you're sitting there and you're going, what the fuck? It's okay. I feel your pain. That was me many years ago. <laughs> Again, practice, practice, practice is the only way you are going to be able to truly apprehend this and understand it and own it and make it your bitch, okay? And you have to. You must make the con Engel prelog system your bitch. A statement that, given that all three of those guys look pretty straight laced in the old timey pictures of them, was a statement that probably would have blown their minds to hear somebody say. <laughs> but that's how we roll on this fucking channel. Alright, we're gonna keep going here. This is a homework problem which you can read on your own. Now, optical activity. Okay, for this part, the textbook explains it very well, so we're going to follow along with what it has to say. The molecules of enantiomers are not superposable, and on this basis alone, we have concluded that enantiomers are different compounds. How are they different? Do enantiomers resemble constitutional isomers and diastereomers in having different melting points and boiling points? The answer is no, which you already know because I already told you that. Pure enantiomers have identical melting and boiling points. Very important to remember it though. Do pure enantiomers have different indices of refraction, different solubilities in common solvents, different infrared spectra, and different rates of reaction with achiral reagents? The answer to each of these questions is also no. All right, so you would not be able to separate enantiomers on the basis of any of these things. Many of these properties are dependent on the magnitude of the intermolecular forces operating between the molecules. And for molecules that are mere images of each other, these forces will be identical. We can see an example of this if we examine Table 5.1, where boiling points of the two butanol enantiomers are listed. And you can see down here, 
I'm, I'm keeping this low intentionally. I don't, the next part applies to what we're about to read. So you can see here that they're the same. That's the only thing you need to take from this, is that the boiling points are the same. I guess they just wanted you to look at a table, so, you know, in case you didn't trust them, although it's their table. <laughs> now, mixtures of the enantiomers of a compound have different properties than pure samples of each, however. The data in table 5.1 illustrates this for tartaric acid. So, here we go. Here's the reveal. So, tartaric acid, one enantiomer, is, has a melting point in 168 to 170 C, so does the other one. However, in mixture, in a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers, called a racemic mixture, R-A-C-E-M-I-C, has a different melting point. All right, so that is important to remember, okay? Don't, don't expect your pure enantiomer to necessarily have the exact same physical properties as your racemic mixture. Okay, so you see, textbook there, same what I already said, yada yada. Enantiomers show different behavior only when they interact with other chiral substances, including their own enantiomer. This is evident in the melting point data above. Enantiomers also show different rates of reaction towards other chiral molecules, that is, towards reagents that consist of a single enantiomer or an excess of a single enantiomer. Now we're starting to see something that is very useful. Enantiomers show different rates of reaction with other chiral molecules, okay? Very important to remember that. And enantiomers show different solubilities in solvents that consist of a single enantiomer or an excess of a single enantiomer, all right? So it's a chiral solvent where it's either all of one enantiomer or it's like, I don't know, like 75% enantiomer A and 25% B, just pulling that out of my ass. But all you need to know is one enantiomer is in a significant excess from the other one. One easily observable way in which enantiomers differ is their behavior towards plain polarized light. What is plain polarized light? Let's jump down here for a second. So you know light is electromagnetic, meaning it has an electrical component and a magnetic component. These are always at 90 degrees from each other, okay? The electric field oscillates in one plane, the magnetic field oscillates in another plane that is 90 degrees from the electric field. All right, everybody with me? If we were to view a beam of ordinary light from one end, and if we could actually see the planes in which the electrical oscillations were occurring, we would find that oscillations of the electric field were occurring in all possible planes perpendicular to the direction of propagation. The same would be true of the magnetic field, all right? So natural light is a mixture where you have light photons that are oscillating in all manners of different planes. It doesn't matter um, so long as it has this kind of arrangement versus the direction that it's moving and that the electrical and magnetic components are always 90 degrees apart, all right? When ordinary light is passed through a polarizer, the polarizer interacts with the electric field so that the electric field of the light that emerges from the polarizer and, of course, the magnetic field that is perpendicular to it is oscillating only in one plane. Such light is called plane polarized light. That's what's going on here. And all you need to know is that enantiomers can rotate this plane polarized light. Okay, everybody follow me? When a beam of plane polarized light passes through an enantiomer, the plane of the polarization rotates. Separate enantiomers rotate the plane of the polarized light in equal amounts, but in opposite directions. Separate enantiomers are said to be optically active compounds because of their effect on plane polarized light. So, we already talked about this the polarimeter. The device that is used for measuring the effect of optically active compounds on plane polarized light is a polarimeter. So you see a sketch of it here. You have the light source, you have the polarizer, you have your 
sample cell that has your optically active compound in it. And then you have whatever you're using here to, to receive the signal to detect it and measure the degree to which it has rotated plane polarized light. Does that make sense, I hope? Very much so, I hope that that is the case. And the way this works is that there's another polarizer down here at the detector, okay? You have to rotate this such that it is in line with this or else the light can't pass through it, just like you can see in this picture here, all right? You have two polarizer, like these polarized sunglasses here. If they're not perfectly in line with each other, the light is blocked. So you would turn this thing until you suddenly saw the light. And then you would measure the angle. Everybody with me? Okay. If the cell of the polarimeter is empty, or if an optically inactive substance is present, in other words, something that is achiral or a 50-50 mix of enantiomers of a chiral substance, the axes of the plane polarized light in the analyzer will be exactly parallel when the instrument reads zero, and the observer will detect the maximum amount of light passing through. If, by contrast, the cell contains an optically active substance, a solution of one enantiomer, for example, the plane of polarization of the light will be rotated as it passes through the cell. In order to detect the maximum brightness of the light, the observer will have to rotate the axis of the analyzer in either a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. In other words, they mean... Ah, shit. It's down here. They mean from zero. You gotta rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay? If the analyzer is rotated in a clockwise direction, the rotation, which is alpha, measured in degrees, is said to be positive. If the rotation is counterclockwise, the rotation is said to be negative. A substance that rotates plane polarized light in the clockwise direction is said to be dextratory, and one that rotates plane polarized light in a counterclockwise direction is said to be levatory. All right, and these are two words that are based on different Latin words for right and left. Dexter and Levis, I guess. I know this is pronounced levatory, so that's fine. Dextratory. So, usually you see this abbreviated as dextro or levo. So, if you've ever seen those terms like dextroamphetamine, well, now you know where it comes from. Um, dextroamphetamine would rotate plain polarized light in the clockwise direction, all right? Levo amphetamine would rotate it in the counterclockwise direction. Everybody starting to see this? Yes, you've been seeing this shit your whole life and you didn't know what it was. Okay, and our final topic for this video, we are going to discuss specific rotation. Now, here's something else you may have seen if you were ever stuck in the library at school, perusing through something like the Merck Index, looking at all the drugs that you wished you were not at school and doing. <laughs> uh, memories. <laughs> anyway, um, you'll see this kind of stuff all the time, and now you're about to learn what it means. The number of degrees that the plane of polarization is rotated as the light passes through a solution of an enantiomer depends on the number of chiral molecules that it encounters. To normalize optical, it depends on a whole bunch of things actually. To normalize optical rotation data relative to experimental variables such as the tube length and the concentration of the enantiomer, Chemists calculate a quantity called the specific rotation, which is alpha in brackets, by the following equation. Where A is the observed rotation, C is the concentration of the solution in grams per milliliter of solution, or density in grams per milliliter for neat liquids, in other words, for pure liquids. And L is the length of the cell in decimeters. One decimeter is equal to 10 centimeters. Anybody that's taken general chem and has seen spectrophotometry will be familiar with our friend, the decimeter. Now, the specific rotation also depends on the temperature and the wavelength of light 
that is employed. It also depends on the solvent, if it is a compound dissolved in a solvent. Specific rotations are reported so as to incorporate these quantity as well. A specific rotation might be given as the following. So you see here, A in brackets tells us it's the specific rotation. D means that it's the D line of a sodium lamp. So the light has a wavelength of 589.6 nanometers. So it's very standardized. And the temperature is 25 C. The sample contained one gram per milliliter of the optically active substance in a one decimeter long tube and it produced a rotation of 3.12 degrees in a clockwise direction. And that little asterisk is just pointing you to a footnote that mentions that the solvent also matters and so is frequently reported with this. So now, for the rest of your life, when you see this shit, you will remember this video and you will go, God damn it, that PMC, he was fucking awesome. He cleared up something I've never understood before. Or you already knew this. <laughs> now, the part that we're about to talk about here is very, very important, okay? So you can see that, you know, we have our compounds here, and the specific rotation is reported for all of them, and you do see it like this a lot. Um, now, this is really, really, really important, okay? Okay. No obvious correlation exists between the RNS configuration of enantiomers and the direction in which they rotate plain polarized light. Okay? You can't tell if it's going to rotate plain polarized light clockwise or counterclockwise um, just by knowing whether it's R or S. All right? So we see R plus 2 methyl 1 butanol and R minus 1 chloro. 2 methyl butane have the same configuration. That is, they have the same general arrangement of their atoms in space. They have, however, an opposite effect on the direction of the rotation of the plane of plane polarized light. So you see that? They have the same configuration of stuff, yet one rotates it one way and one rotates it another. And no, you can't really say anything meaningful about, well, this one's a hydroxyl, so, or this one's a chlorine. No, no. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, the only, I, there's just no way to predict whether it's going to be plus or minus, dextro or levo, um, based on whether it's R or S. Also, no necessary correlation exists between the R and S designation and the direction of rotation of plane polarized light. So R2-methyl-1-butanol is dextratory, and R1-chloro-2-methyl-butane is levatory. All right? So don't get tripped up by this. You know, and this is why you see it written like this. This is the complete way of writing it, okay? Um, it would be nice if it was always written like this. But if you know that it is the R-enantiomer, you can always go check the literature, and it will tell you everything else you need to know, whether it's dextro or levo and all that other good stuff. All right? A method based on the measurements of optical rotation at many different wavelengths called optical rotary dispersion has been used to correlate configurations of chiral molecules, but a discussion of this technique is beyond the scope of this text. Plus, I don't know how to do it, so I would be a poor person to be teaching you. And you see here, race mi mixtures, which I already talked about. We'll go over that just to make sure everybody has a good understanding of it next time. But we're getting close to 40 minutes here, so I'm going to wrap this up here. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Maybe throw a few bucks my way. If you didn't like it, well, I... I Kudos to you for sticking through with this this far if you don't like this shit. Subscribe, comment, share the video, and until the next one, y'all, I will see you later.